Welcome to the NCAS Monthly Regulatory Brief. I'm Aileen McDonough, your host and Director of Content Marketing at NContracts. In this podcast, our compliance team provides an overview and analysis of the latest regulatory changes for financial institutions, along with info and trends to help you keep up with the rapidly evolving nature of compliance. Let's get started. Hello, and thank you for joining us for another issue of our Regulatory Brief. Joining me today is our Regulatory Compliance Councils, Cheryl Grizzard and Robert Brosh. I am Stephanie Lyon, Vice President of Compliance, and we're going to be giving you the most important regulatory changes and developments for the month of September. We're going to do so in three parts. The first part are topics that everyone in the financial services will care about. Then we're going to move on to topics hot topics affecting depository institutions and end with our mortgage companies. Our first topic today pertains to the ability to communicate with your customers in a way that is operationally feasible. And we're gonna start with litigation on that front. Robert has all the information on that. Absolutely, so automatic telephone dialing systems. So many of you will remember that we previously discussed the Facebook versus Dugoid Supreme Court case, uh, where the court ruled that under the TCPA, equipment that merely dials from a list and doesn't incorporate a, or, or doesn't use a random or sequential number generator is not actually bound by the TCPA's requirements to obtain uh, prior express consent uh, before making calls or text messages for whatever reason that your institution is doing so. And so there was recently a big win for banks, um, in particular in a federal court out of Nebraska, um, which found in favor of USAA, um, who had used equipment with numbers provided by USA members and loaded into the equipment by um, a USA employee. Um, and, and so the Supreme Court, up, or so the federal court out of Nebraska upheld that Supreme Court case. Um, and the court even went a step further Um, on the Supreme Court's ruling by stating that capacity under the TCPA uh, to store and produce telephone numbers using a random or sequential number generator uh, actually means present capacity, not the ability to be programmed to do so. Um, So you can definitely feel safe using some sort of auto dialer for your employees to contact customers, as long as those numbers dialed are those coming from a list that you've legally obtained um, and that are not randomly generated. All right, so thank you so much for that, Robert. There is a lot of the complexities around being able to dial your customers nowadays, so your breakdown was really helpful. We're gonna move on to our BSA, AML, and OFAC update. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, we had OFAC designate its first vir- virtual exchange where we know ransomware payments are being facilitated through. And just recently we saw Colonial Pipe, if you might remember that from the summer that targeted that mid-Atlantic fuel dispenser and it caused a whole lot of issues for people living in those areas thinking they need to go get gas. Um, And the reason that OFAC chose this specific designated person now so that you can't transact through it is to limit the ability for financial institutions to pay their ransomware through there, because we know that when you make payments to criminals, they're likely not having the national interest of the United States at heart when they're targeting our institutions and our government agencies, as well as other profit or profitable companies. So OFAC didn't just do the designation, they also issued an advisory that both serves as very informational And like a slight warning to financial institutions that if you do in fact get attacked and you have a ransomware attack on your institution and you are going out of your way to perhaps make payments, first of all, they're really discouraging you to even consider making the payment. Operationally, that doesn't really work if you're locked out of every single account that you manage, if you're locked out of all your loans, all your data. It's just one of those things that they're saying, you better be prepared so it doesn't happen to you because if it does happen to you, you're being put in a position between choosing to make the payment. And if that payment is being issued to a designated party, taken into account that OFAC is a strict liability type of regulation and law. So even if you unknowingly transacted, made a payment to a designated person or party, 
you could be on the hook for strict liability violations spanning thousands of dollars. So that was OFAC's friendly way of reminding you to take into account sanctions risks and, and take that into account with your cybersecurity program. Also, it's very fitting that October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Day. So take this month and ensure that you have the appropriate training because the best thing you can do is have human firewalls and I know that's a fun topic or a fun, fun, fun uh, term, but it just means that your employees are aware of what could happen if they click on the wrong link, if they download a file that has malware. You want to avoid those really easily detectable situations and train your employees to be aware and to always be cautious. On the FinCEN front, they released also a, an advisory, and this one had to do with child sexual exploitation, which unfortunately due to the pandemic has been up both in the distribution and other factors involved with that type of horrifying crime. And so they just want financial institutions to be aware of what it looks like, what kind of transactions you might see so that you can file the appropriate suspicious activity reports. In the SARS or suspicious activity reports, FinCEN is asking you to include specific keywords so it's easier for government agencies, law enforcement to find these specific type of SARS that pertain to child sexual exploitation and send them to the right departments quickly. So look at those advisories, be mindful and always report your suspicious activity in a timely fashion. Now we're gonna switch over to section 1071. You probably heard a little bit about this a specific new or proposed regulation, and Robert is going to tell us more about how we're going to go about implementing this in the future. That's right. So Section 1071. So on September 1st, the CFPB issued its long-awaited small business lending data collection proposed rule. And so the rule requires financial institutions to collect and report loan data on uh, women-owned, minority-owned, and small businesses in connection with applications for credit. Uh, and so the data collected is based both on the credit transaction and the applicant itself. Uh, and it includes data uh, generated or provided by the financial institution, data provided by the applicant, applicant, and also data points that address the demographics of the applicant's principal uh, owners or the ownership status of that institution. And so as part of that data collection, financial institutions also have to limit or firewall who has access to that data, um, including the race, ethnicity, and sex of the employees. Um, and, and so those employees that need to be firewalled are those who are in a position to make credit decisions about applications. And you can just kind of see that's more than likely to prevent any sort of discrimination on behalf of the financial institutions or allowing any of that information to impact those credit decisions, even in a favorable way. Um, so that way the institutions can't kind of slide under the radar based on the information that they know, perhaps pass loans that they wouldn't have in the first place. Um, and so the data is gonna be submitted annually to the CFPB who will then make it public. Uh, big aspect there, right? You wanna make sure that um, as you're making loans, that you are offering them equally and fairly to all small businesses that are applying. Um, and it's certainly going to require a switch in the way that your institution's small business lending department operates. Um, and it'll probably require amending applications and updating systems just to ensure that you're collecting all of the data that is required. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. And I have heard that this is being referred to as the CRA for small businesses. And if you're a mortgage company or a credit union that don't have CRA requirements today, just get ready for this because it's going to be quite a change. All right, we're going to move on to the CFPB. We have been awaiting the appointment of the director of the CFPB for quite some time, and it finally happened on September 30th. The nominee, Rohit Chopra, was appointed by the Senate and confirmed. And we know he is not new to the CFPB whatsoever. There has been reports that he has been linked to Senator Elizabeth Warren whenever the CFPB was newly created and he has had quite an impact on the agency already. Some of his priorities could be around fair lending enforcement, 
um, going after payday loans or lenders and also for student servicers. So that is something that you need to be on the lookout for. We know that the CFPB is coming back ready for issuing enforcement, issue, ready to look into unfair, deceptive, abusive acts or practices. So it's no time to sleep on the agency at the moment. Something else that we're gonna talk about is the CFPB just released a report, a research report about consumer complaints. And I love talking about complaints because they are incredibly important to determine where you may have compliance violations, where you may have controls that have deficiencies. And the Bureau now has also issued this report that is a little bit innovative because they took into account the census tract in which these complaints were coming from. So they could determine if the complaint came from a wealthier neighborhood, a more low income, a minority populated neighborhood. And what they found is that there are quite a few differences between the types of complaints that are originating from wealthier white mostly neighborhoods and they are around just loan originations while those complaints coming from more minority type neighborhoods that are not as wealthy are around loan servicing such as for example trying to help get loan uh, assistance when they can't repay credit reporting violations and their opinions of delinquency practices so the CFPB is now noticing that not only could we have fair lending violations just by virtue of your lending practices, but complaints could also reveal where you're causing most harm in a specific type of practice, whether it's servicing, delinquencies, mortgages, et cetera. And we expect the CFPB to take this type of information and infuse it into their enforcements, infuse it into their rulemaking, so again, this is just a really friendly reminder to create your own consumer complaint program, make sure it's effective, and make sure you are on top of any type of issue that could be at your institution because proactiveness is really going to be helpful here. And also understanding the relationship between complaints, fair lending, and other ways in which you may be treating your consumers, your borrowers in a way that's disparate. So on that note, let's move on to state law, state changes. Last month, we had our colleague Shelby tell you a little bit about New York and the departure of a really important agency head. And Cheryl is going to follow up on that story. Absolutely. New York, New York. Uh, as we said, we did report last month that Linda Lacewell stepped down as the superintendent of the Department of Financial Services. Since then, Governor Hochul has nominated Adrian Harris as superintendent. Now, Ms. Harris has an extensive financial services background. Namely, she worked for the US Department of Treasury. She was a part of the Obama administration where she served as economic advisor. And she's also provided support for several FinTech companies. Now, there is some support from Democrats for her nomination. However, there has been a little pushback from legislators um, saying that they are concerned about her ties to the Obama administration and about her ties to financial services companies. So we'll keep you informed of any new activities that come from this nomination. So just stay tuned. Um, also coming out of New York, the Department of Financial Services also issued guidance to mortgage lenders. And this uh, guidance is coming from a study they did where they are they investigated mortgage loans from five major mortgage lenders in New York. And what they found was in the study, they did a comparison of same sex applicants that and they what they determined was the applicants were denied mortgage loans at higher rates than opposite sex paired applicants. Now, these they regulators um, acknowledged that they couldn't determine with certainty whether the, the discrimination occurred because some applicants would, could have consisted of father son pairs or two sisters so they they couldn't be just certain that discrimination occurred however they felt that there was enough information revealed that it warranted further guidance. So some of the things that they recommended were tasking the board and senior management with the responsibility of developing fair lending plans. Um, they also recommended continual monitoring of the application processes, 
um, underwriting processes, policies and procedures, um, you know, pricing, um, also employee training programs. So pretty extensive guidance coming out of New York. Um, so just be aware of, you know, avoiding just the, the appearance of discrimination based on sexual orientation. Thank you, Cheryl. And I expect no less from New York to be issuing some substantive guidance, all right? So we're gonna move on to issues affecting depository institutions. And Robert is gonna lead us with something that has been on the news quite consistently around the IRS reporting requirements. Yeah, so Congress has proposed the Build Back Better Act, say that five times fast, which includes the uh, new IRS account tracking requirements for financial institutions uh, that were that was first referenced in President Biden's American Families Plan Act. Uh, and so under this, these requirements, financial institutions have to track and submit uh, to the IRS information on the inflows and outflows of every account um, that's at their institution over a minimum threshold of $600 during the year. Um, and that includes breakdowns for cash as well. And so Congress has stated that the goal of this data collection is to uncover tax dodging by the wealthy. Um, so it is interesting that $600 is the minimum amount. Uh, you know, as is to be expected, trade associations are up in arms over the requirement, addressing significant privacy concerns and the liability uh, for all affected parties. Um, by requiring the collection of this enormous amount of financial information for just about every American without a real proper explanation of how the IRS is planning on storing and protecting and, and really using uh, this, this huge database of information. Um, and it'll be interesting to watch to see whether or not that $600 minimum gets raised. Uh, but even if it were really to go to about $10,000, it's, it's still going to require a lot of updates to policies and systems. Um, and it definitely might be a good time if you're a fintech looking for a new product to team up with banks, um, you know, as, as sort of a product to track those um, inflows and outflows, as long as you're complying with all, you know, related affiliate and, and privacy uh, regulations and laws. I think, Robert, it's a perfect time for everyone to make some noise, go to your congressman and scream from the top of your lungs that this is not something you want. It is a lot. So if you want to be heard right now, it's the time before this becomes part of a law. All right, we're going to move on to our banking institutions. Cheryl, what are some of the regulators that specifically look at banks doing and saying? Well, um, the FRB issued guidance for community banks looking to partner with fintech companies. And what they did was they analyzed different types of partnerships um, that will assist these small banks in helping with, helping with their technology. Uh, some of the guidance broke down each of the individual partnerships, just outlining the risk and benefits. Um, for instance, one uh, partnership that they discussed was an operational partnership. This would consist of bringing in fintech companies to help with some of their banking processes, um, perhaps some of their fraud detection services and uh, BSA compliance, helping them comply with BSA compliance. Some of the challenges they brought up, brought up um, that they need to think about would be that the community banks may need to look into hiring you know, people with more expertise. So, um, they wanted them to kind of look at that, you know, study that and see if that's something that, you know, that's the type of relationship that they wanted them to explore. Um, another relationship was a customer oriented relationship. Now this one would be um, customer facing and would offer things like online account opening helps with helping with online accounts. Um, also helping, helping with enhancing their mobile applications. Um, the bankers that they spoke with, they mentioned that during COVID-19, this was really helpful for them to have access to something that they could, customers could access online. So um, that was another option. And then finally, there was a front end partnership relationship they discussed. And essentially that one was where they are working directly with the FinTechs, allowing them to interact with their customers. Now, this one probably posed the most risk because you have the third party 
liability risk where you're essentially holding them out as an extension of the bank. So those are just some of the things to keep in mind when considering, you know, a partnership with a fintech company. Thank you, Cheryl. And do we have anything else from the regulators, Robert? Uh, yeah, so for the OCC, uh, quite a bit of news on the OCC's end. Uh, one, throughout the month of September, they did issue three new booklets of their compliance handbook, of the comptroller's handbook, and those were earnings, regulatory reporting, and problem bank supervision. So if you think your institution is lacking in any of those areas, definitely take a look because that is what you are going to be, um, or that's what the OCC is going to use to examine you. Um, so definitely recommend that. But probably bigger than that news is the fact that President Biden announced Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna screw up the name. I apologize, Miss Amarova, if you are listening. But it's Saule Amarova as nominee for the comptroller. Uh, and so Amarova is currently a professor at Cornell Law School and has been a banking attorney previously and also worked at the Treasury Department. Uh, and so the banking industry really isn't is is not happy about the nomination to say the least, uh, due to some of Amarova's prior proposals. Um, which included requiring community banks to pass their deposits through to the Federal Reserve. Uh, she has also recommended abolishing the FDIC as deposit insurer in the past um, and also as a, a state chartered supervisor. And then she's also suggested breaking up some of the larger and more regional banking institutions. And so just as a reminder, the comptroller is appointed by the president um, with advice and consent of the Senate, meaning that she has to get a majority vote um, by the Senate to go through. Uh, and this could definitely be tougher than expected with a razor thin margin for the Democrats and also a candidate who has some new ideas for the banking industry. So it'll certainly be interesting to watch that nomination process go forward. Thank you, Robert. And you're right, that, that definitely seems like an uphill battle for the nominee. I will say for banks listening right now, don't panic too much because sometimes people like to get their names out there with very interesting proposals, such as the ones Robert mentioned. And it doesn't mean that once appointed, they're gonna go start implementing their fun ideas. It just means that when you're an academic or in private practice, you can get away with saying some really interesting things. So, so don't panic yet. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to credit union topics. And today we don't have a lot from NCUA. They haven't been doing a whole lot. That means they must be taking their summer break a little bit late. But what we do know is they had their board meeting just recently. And in that board meeting, the agency uh, decided to approve a proposal that is going to modify the subordinate debt rule. Just as a reminder, subordinate debt rule goes into effect January 1st, 2022. This specific proposal that I'm talking about modifies that final rule that will go into effect later on. But for a lot of you, most of you that are listening, this is not going to be applicable. If you are a minority depository low income credit union, this is for you. And not only do you have to be that type of charter, you might also need to be participating in secondary capital programs issued by the US government. And what they're trying to do with this proposed rule is grant you a little bit of regulatory relief. So if you obtain the secondary capital before December 31st, 2021, it would be grandfathered into the subordinate debt rule. However, if you did it after December, the new rule would take into effect. And what they're trying to do is rather than have you go back and reapply because it's a couple of days later, they're going to allow you to grandfather your secondary capital under the new subordinate debt rule as well. So again, very limited applicability here for most financial institutions, for most credit unions. But if it is you, if you are engaging in secondary capital, make sure you're taking a look at the proposed rule because it will offer you reg relief. And we're gonna end our NCAST today with issues affecting mortgage companies and Cheryl is going to take it away. All right, Rocket Mortgage, they are in the hot seats. Rocket Mortgage um, is a mortgage loan provider, and they were involved in a multi-state investigation, which ended up in them having to shell out $500,000, and this, each of the states had to divvy this money up. Basically, what happened, um, Rocket Mortgage was 
uh, allegedly engaging in some deceptive advertising practices. So um, the states had been complaining that they were making advertisements that were breaking some state and federal laws. So um, ultimately what they Rocket had to end up doing was agreeing to several things, namely that they would clearly disclose discount points that they were advertising. They would um, clearly disclose what amount customers had to pay in order to get certain discount rates. Um, they also agreed to see certain deceptive advertising practices that were revealed during the investigation. And they even had to update some marketing, telemarketing scripts that they uh, were um, using. So ultimately what this brought about was a strong warning from each of the regulators is that, hey, we take advertising rules seriously. And as a mortgage lender, you need to comply with advertising laws. Um, they're going to continue monitoring this and they are not afraid to bring strong enforcement action. So mortgage lenders beware, you have to abide by the advertising laws. So that does it for us. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Robert. Again, Stephanie Lyon here with you today. If you have any questions on the topics we covered here, make sure to take a look at your NCOMPLY that has the latest regulatory changes, news, guidance, and so much more. And we can't wait to catch up with you or next month on our NCAST Reg Brief where we're going to talk about everything that is going to happen in the month of October. Thank you. That wraps up this month's NCAS Regulatory Brief, talking with our compliance experts about the latest regulatory changes you need to be aware of. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And if you're not subscribed yet, we invite you to do so on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening.